welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 8, Rebirth Stories, Buddhism 101. If you had the experience of meeting someone and sort of falling in love rather abruptly with them, then it's likely you had a relationship in previous lives. And I love this in American audiences. I say this means that you should not make too hard any deals with your exes, even if you get divorces in this country, because you're going to fall in love with that ex again. <laughs> <laughs> next time, and they're going to drive a worse bargain next time in the next life, likely. And you actually already went through this again and again, so although people will separate, it does happen. You know, don't be too, remain friends if possible, try, you know. Don't fight over the house and the garage and the dog and the everything and the custodial rights and blah, blah, blah. I always say that. And uh, so there is this concept of soul thing, you know. Also, sometimes one can be reborn or around one can be reborn enemies as well. And strong emotion will keep you, strong connected emotion in some way will bring people together. Revenge is a powerful motive, I think, where people will be reborn perhaps in the family of those that killed them in the previous life and so on. I'm always waiting for some, somebody, some child to turn up in Dallas with a mustache <laughs> speaking Arabic. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, and... Uh, and sort of become a car wrecker around Dallas. But never mind about that. So that's possible, of course. And actually, it also it leads to ghosts and things. People who try to stay in the between state because they're desperately trying to get, keep a possessive connection to a being they were related to in the, in the previous life, you know, who hasn't died. You know. So ghosts often, either for vengeance or out of attachment and love, one or the other. Uh, that also can happen. And there are rituals when someone dies to see to it that they don't try to come back to their body, that they realize they just better to be more open and go to another good embodiment, etc. Try to be human again because it's such a valuable thing. Try to find a nice womb in a good neighborhood. <laughs> there are rituals like that. And the Book of the Dead is a way of trying to encourage a being to go for the rebirth situation in an open way. But then you were inspiring me to tell a story, if you all don't mind. Uh, I was in London uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. I can't tell at my age. You know, sometimes I see someone and I say, oh, I haven't seen you for a couple of years. They say, oh, it's 11 years, Bob. <laughs> okay, you know, time goes really fast, you know. But anyway, I was in London some years ago, and the Sunday Times had a special section. I, I guess it's sort of like the review section in, our, in the New York Times. And um, there was a story about a woman in, who lived in uh, northwestern England in her late 40s and uh, early 50s who had attracted notice because she had recovered her connection to nine children that she became to believe she had had in a previous life in Ireland, where she died in childbirth, giving birth to the ninth who survived. And the Catholic fathers that were interviewed by the reporter who studied this extraordinary case, they were saying things like, well, you know, in the church, we don't believe in that reincarnation business. But if we did, this woman would be sure proof of it. And uh, they, you know, all those orphanages, she specially broke their rules about telling where such and such children had gone. And she reunited, I think, the eight, seven or eight who survived of those children. And she had been obsessed about it since she was in her 
20s and married and had another batch of children as an English wife and only got into it when they'd grown up and, you know, sort of her husband and she, she was sort of middle class, felt that she didn't have to work for a while and she could go and pursue this endless obsession she had of what happened to those children because of having died in childbirth in the trauma of it in a very poor place with an alcoholic husband in a very run-down cottage, the ninth child, you know, like helpless situation, and very anxious about what would happen to all of the ch- kids who were adopted out, you know, separately from each other, and their eventual reunion, although they didn't all leave where there are different circumstances, but they at least met each other, and the older ones then did remember about the younger ones. The younger ones had no clue, kind of, you know, it's a certain getting down to a certain age about it. And, uh, and the priests who were in the orphanage... Uh, Adoption service agencies, you know, et cetera, from the church. They were just all there, and it was like a, they had a thing. That's how it came to the news notice, you know. And I remember I was with a lama there who was a friend, and ever since that, he read that too. I read it to him, you know, he didn't speak English. I was so amazed to see it in the, in the Sunday section of the Times. And there was many details that were really mind-blowing. And... Um, she didn't get anything much out of it, you know, people most lot didn't believe it, but this reporter wrote it up because of the testimony of the people in the institutions, you know, where she found them all. And then ever since then, when people would talk to him about, which used to be worse than in this group, like a lot of you held up your hands about former and future laws, but I used to have a lot of arguments with like, well, yeah, I really like that, Professor Thurman, but I do have a problem with that rebirth thing, you know, I, I can't tell you how long I've been dealing with that. And... Um, that Lama, when he would get that kind of a challenge or question, he would just say, I don't really discuss it, just read the newspaper. <laughs> he would say, and there's an enormous amount of evidence. There's someone called Ian Stevenson, who might also be from Irie, but actually he was in Virginia, he was, you know, long, long immigrated here. And Chester Carlson, who was the inventor of Xerox and the CEO of that corporation, in the, four, in the 50s, I think, gave him a grant. He was chairman of psychology department at UVA Charlottesville at that time and gave a grant of a million dollars in those days, which probably is 20 now, uh, to found an institution to, to trace and track down and document cases of children remembering previous lives in all around the world. And there are thousands of these cases, and they're totally documented, and the vast majority of them are where the, nobody's getting anything out of this memory, and sometimes even families trying to suppress it because of some embarrassment about the previous life, some connection, some spectacular ones like that. So, you know, the materialists, my friends at Harvard and MIT and, and at Columbia and the science departments, they just say, there's no evidence for that. Oh, there's no evidence. But, of course, there's a lot of evidence. They can investigate it and decide, oh, this is fake, or that's what wrongly reported, or that story in London is just nonsense, or I went to see the lady, or whatever it is. They can try to debunk it, but they can't say there is no evidence. There's huge evidence, but meanwhile, they're hoist by their own petard, since there's no evidence that you're nothing when you die. That never will be any evidence, actually. It's nothing but an assertion. Because your brain is not functioning, your heart is not beating, therefore your consciousness is gone. That is a complete, unevidenced assertion. There's no way of proving that whatsoever. And actually, Christianity, when you say a lot of new things, well, true. But Christianity uh, has a future life, of course. And then uh, until Benedict they almost had different future lives because if you went to purgatory, that was a lot different than when you got to heaven. So that was almost like two future lives because you could change in purgatory. Although I understand Benedict banned it. <laughs> Poor guy, it was a German guy. Sometimes they get a little carried away. And with their authority, Cardinal Ratzinger, you know. And uh, what's his sort of name? He's Austrian. What? He's Austrian. Well, that's German, you know. Right? <laughs> That's and uh, I'm German, part of, so I'm not, I'm not against Germans. I'm just saying they get a little bit carried away with getting things organized, organized. And uh, they do that. And then I have a thing. I had one lady in, uh, in, in Costa Rica once who gave me this thing, too, about, oh, it's so different, you know. We, didn't, we don't have multiple lives. And, uh, but then she encouraged me to be intrusive by telling me a story about her abuelita, her grandmother, because her grandmother used to have a Buddha ashtray on her mantelpiece, which she liked. 
And the local priest would come for coffee, and he would scold her about that Buddha and tell her to destroy it, that it was evil and all this. So then she finally got tired of that, so she put it away in her closet. She didn't destroy it, but she put it in the closet. And then when the Dalai Lama came to San Jose, where we were traveling, to meet, meet Oscar Arias and these people, there was a thing on TV where he was sitting with the, in a multi-faith thing with the Archbishop of San Jose, and uh, they sat you know, they talked and whatever, and there were some other religious figures there from San Jose. So then the lady told me that her grandmother took her Buddha ashtray out of the thing and put it on the, back on the mantelpiece and invited the local priest for coffee and said, if the archbishop can sit on TV and hold hands with the Dalai Lama for half an hour, I can have my Buddha on my mantelpiece, she said. <laughs> so I was a little bit, you know, encouraged by that. So I said, well, you think you don't have a former life? Really? And she says, yeah. I said, well, where does your soul come from then? She said, well, I don't know. I guess God puts it in my body. She's like, you know, thinking about which trimester or whatever. Who knows what she's thinking about? <laughs> so, then, so then I said, well, really? Well, where did God keep it before that? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you don't want to think that God didn't know about you before you were born. Isn't God omniscient? No, no, I wouldn't want to say he didn't know about me. I said, well, then you must have existed before you were born. I said, where were you? Was God keeping you in a filing cabinet so you didn't have to be reborn somewhere? Or how was he training you up to be a good soul in a human body? So then we went off of this, and she was giggling. We had a lot of fun. And the thing, I didn't even know at that time, that was, that was decades ago, I didn't know at that time that actually in the Mediterranean, in Jesus' time, metempsychosis or reincarnation was the common sense culture. It was not, uh, the, the common sense culture was not modern materialism. It was that people were reborn endlessly. So all sorts of things like in Book of Revelation, Second Coming, all sorts of things that Jesus said, you know, I'll be back within this generation, etc. Although he did not, he showed that you can't kill an, an enlightened yogin, yogi like him, a great siddha, divine, semi-divine being, you can't kill them. But still, that, that a lot of those things should be reinterpreted in the different testaments in the light of people who culturally believed that people were reborn. Not that normal people can't, of course, survive death by violence the way he did, but everyone gets reborn, in other words, in that culture. And yet, yet now these are read in the current contemporary Catholic Church or Protestant Church or whatever, Coptic Church, all these things, uh, in the terms of as if the common sense worldview at that time was the same materialistic thing about like us, that you'd, everybody's just a brain, you know that starts at five years of age or something, their sense of identity. And actually, people, when they do die, usually if they are lucky to die naturally of natural causes, which includes some kinds of sicknesses in, in age, if they do, they, can't, they want to go. There's a time when people decide that, you know, the, at a subliminal level, the mind decides this body no longer works. I'm just, I'm going to move on. And also, people on subliminal never kind of know that they do have a continuum. That's why your lifelong materialist calls in the rabbi, the priest, the minister, and the Tibetan Lama and reads the Book of the Dead in those last weeks and calls their arch enemy and the arch fiend so-and-so and their old brother-in-law they hated, etc., and calls them in and says, I forgive you, please forgive me. And they do all this stuff. It's, because, it's not because at that point they don't expect to be nothing. Nobody, even though they've had a theory for life that they're going to be, they'd give it up at that time. I watched my 97-year-old grandfather go through that. Lifelong materialist. And completely changed in those last times. You know? And uh, so everyone knows that. We know in our bones that we are not reducible to something. There's something mysterious about us that goes on. Everyone knows that. They don't know what it is. They may be conflated with some idea that there's some absolute thing that never changes, that's immune to everything, that, they're going to, that they somehow wish they could withdraw into. They might be wrongly conflating that feeling of presence with this sort of absolute presence thing, which is unfortunate. But everyone knows it. 
we have a thing actually this spring, Art of Dying. Uh, we're going to have a, it's the fourth or fifth one we've done, Tibet House, which is involved with Tibetan culture, does with the Open Center in New York, and there's a big thing called Art of Dying in April. My piece of that is I haven't spent that much time with people in the process of dying like some professional people do, which is a very noble work and difficult one. And one but my piece of it is I think it's very important for people to have a map of what's going to possibly happen to them, even if they don't necessarily believe it, but they sort of get ready for the possibility. And uh, because when you are out of body or in a dream state and you don't know what you're doing, and all these phenomena occur, if you're completely unprepared for it, you might navigate it a little less effectively than someone who's sort of more prepared for it. And the Buddhists developed this um, by around the 7th, 8th century in India and exported it to Tibet. And then it became a big thing in Tibet because it was lost in India, this Book of the Dead tradition, which has to... It's not really a Book of the Dead. There are no dead, actually. There's just people continuing lives in other forms. Nobody stays dead. Dead is like just a doorway. You know, when you leave the room, you go through the door, but nobody's in the door. Because there is no absolute thing called a door. You know, line, a line between rooms has no width, so you're just in one room or the other. You know, death is like that. It's very interesting, the whole thing of the growth of the hospice movement and the shielding of people before it grew, the sort of hiding of death in a society. And there's a very interesting thing in Tibet. Supposedly, the book of natural liberation through learning in the between state, which is the actual title of the book, the great book of natural liberation through learning in the between state is what the real title is. Uh, you can see that I have a tape where I give a commentary on it from Sounds True, which has that as a title. But then in order to market it, of course, they put bracket Tibetan Book of the Dead uh, because it's known as that. But that's a wrong Western title. It was written supposedly in that form in the 8th century and hidden in a pillar in a temple, in a secret compartment or something. And then it was brought out in the 14th century by someone, and then it became widely of use. So that's 500 years of um, not using that text. And why? And it's a kind of freaky thing for us, you know, and in the West it's not used. When I worked on translating that book, which had already been translated, and I didn't originally want to even do the job, but I was commissioned to do it, and I only did it because one of my teachers said I should. And then I, when I looked at the older ones, they weren't very good, so I, and I did it. But I was wondering that, why was it hidden for so many years since it's so useful? And how come we hide death since it's so healthy to be aware of your death? If you live in the awareness of your death, it's very powerful, changes your life, makes you much more alive. So why have we like this? And then I realized, of course, it's social authority thing. When Tibet first received these teachings, they were very militaristic. They had an empire like Genghis Khan, big empire. They conquered a lot of India, China, Central Asia, Silk Route. Uh, some Persian Muslims, they conquered them. They were very powerful warriors. And when you want a lot of warriors, you don't want to talk about death. No, but you want to be all that you can be. You, want them, you don't want them watching Platoon. You want them watching Rambo, some sort of glorification of war. And uh, you want them reading the Achilles, uh, Iliad, and Odyssey, and idolizing that t total wimp, Achilles who was wrongly played by the nice Brad Pitt, who should have been played by Stallone. You know, Achilles. You know, Achilles was like, he's all mad, he wants to go fight, he stole his girlfriend. I mean, he really a slave, you know. I mean, it's great literature, the Iliad. It's a bunch of macho Greek turkeys running around like NRA followers, you know, gun advocates. Menelaus and Agamemnon sacrificed his own daughter to get a win to take his fleet over to kill the Trojans. I mean, really, what a bunch of clunks. And we idolize them in our schools. It's iambic pentameter, the Iliad. It's, it's a great classic. Let's translate it for the 26th time. It's a British Empire kind of reading, conditioning people to war. So you don't want people aware of death, because why? It, even if they don't have a theory of karma, they get individualistic when they're going to die. They, they want to say, well, what about me? Like, quality time. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, one of the great pioneers of the hospice movement, she said, I spent time with people dying, over 10,000 people. I helped them, nurse them through the dying process, she said. Over 10,000 people. 
Not a single one of those 10,000 plus people said, and their mom, oh, my great regret is I didn't spend another day at the office. She said. So being aware of death intensifies your individualism and you want to use your life moments, precious as they are, for something meaningful. You want what we call quality time. So you're not going to join Mr. Joe Blow Dumbbell Army. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. You're going to have quality time. You're not going to work in so-and-so's factory. So in our collectivist, industrialized, you know, production is all society, uh, we don't encourage people to be aware of their death. And now that we are doing that, we're maturing as a society, and we're deciding there are some things that aren't worth it. Music provided by Tenzin Chogel. Used with the artist's permission, all rights reserved. To learn more, visit TenzinChogel.com. U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. For a complete listing of all upcoming events, please visit bobthurman.com. Special intensive retreats and programs with Robert Thurman and friends at Menla. Please visit menla.us, located just two hours north of New York City in the heart of the Catskills. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Bob Thurman Podcast. Please be sure to like and subscribe on iTunes and your favorite podcasting platform.